good evening, everyone. If I could get everyone to uh, quiet down uh, for just a brief uh, moment, I wanted to uh, uh, go ahead and take this opportunity to welcome everyone to the Board of Supervisors Chambers. Uh, I'm Pete Vanderpool. I sit on the Board of Supervisors and represent District 2, uh, which includes the southwest part of Tulare County. I noticed several uh, constituents here, and I thank you all for attending. Um, this is, uh, I believe, Government 105. Uh, maybe uh, more. Who's attended one of these sessions before? Please raise your hand. So you're back for more, so that means that they're good. And uh, I really do thank you for your interest in uh, uh, serving uh, Tulare County uh, constituents and special district board members. Uh, I think it's a total fallacy that uh, you're not able to receive the uh, level of training that uh, uh, many of you need for these uh, various special districts that you serve on. Um, and so I really do applaud uh, county staff and the auditor, treasurer, tax collector, uh, office controller, whatever other departments, Rita, that you run. Uh, I really appreciate your staff for volunteering their time and you for volunteering uh, your time as well, and also our county council's office and other local government attorneys. Uh, so let's give them a round of applause, first of all, to thank them for volunteering. Uh, like I said, this is the fifth time uh, they've done this, and I know that there will be more in the future. Uh, many of you, uh, as indicated by the show of hands, are back for your second, third, fourth, maybe fifth time. Um, and each time what we try to do is adjust the curriculum to the needs uh, and questions of audience uh, members. So uh, I hope you will continue to find it interesting and new. Um, uh, take advantage of the experts that are here this evening. They have a lot of information to share with you. Uh, they are here to help you. Uh, we want to help see your special districts function as well as they can uh, because at the end of the day you're all serving the same constituents that we serve um, and it helps to make our jobs easier as well here at the county. So uh, I welcome you. I hope your dinner's uh, good. <laughs> I'm sure it will be. Um, there's coffee in the back. I see that. And I know your presentation will be excellent. Um, so I hope you have a wonderful night tonight and uh, as always if you ever need anything from the county we're here to help. So thank you very much. Enjoy your evening. Well, thank you again all for coming. My name is Mara Erickson. I'm with County Council. Um, and I will be making a couple of presentations tonight, but I'm also sort of the housekeeping person, the MC, if you will. Um, again, uh, Supervisor Vanderpool mentioned the food. Be sure you get your meal. Uh, they're in the back, there's plenty to choose from. Also, there are booklets, uh, which have the PowerPoint presentations in them and room for notes. There's also a certificate that you attended. Um, we are going to be taking several breaks, but absolutely feel free to get up and um, stretch your legs or get some more water, use the restroom, which should, are just outside here or either door, and just down a little bit this way and on your left. Uh, please turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate. Uh, and I think that's all I have to say for now until I'm back. We have Paul San Pietro uh, first off. Good evening. Um, yeah, I work in the auditor's office under Rita. In the, um, I'm over the claims division. So. If you are a district that has uh, several accounts with us, um, we call it maybe a book bookkeeping district, and so you will be dealing with Janet Newman and Major Newbell. Otherwise, in our office, if you um, just kind of have us on a um, less intensive basis, you will um, be dealing with Rhonda Coe. So, um, and so I, I supervise that, that division. And so we're responsible for all the checks going out of the county um, and for reviewing all the payments, including uh, all the special districts. And so tonight I thought we could just take a few moments and look at um, the district budgets and payment vouchers. Um, I'm sure. I guess. Uh, while they're uh, figuring that out, I just wanted to say also that um, thank you. That um, 
feel free during the presentation if you have any questions that pop up or something or an issue that you have with any of these forms or anyone in dealing with uh, accounts payable in our office, feel free to ask a question and we'll just take it from there. Okay, so um, I'm just going to go over a couple of the forms, like I said, that we use and just kind of go over some of the main points that we find uh, issues with and if, like I said, if you have anything that you want to add or, or ask, feel free. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of our forms and the reports that we send out monthly, uh, preparing a budget at the beginning or before the beginning of the fiscal year, amending a budget, uh, preparing payment vouchers, and then maintaining adequate cash. And we can talk about also. And so if you, um, we'll talk about also the difference between cash and budget because sometimes those things can get confused. Okay, so the PBQ, um, you'll notice also it, in this first tab on the book is district budgets and payment vouchers. At the end of all the PowerPoint slides, we provided you with those forms, the PBQ, um, the budget, and the, um, well it's in order, it's actually the order to disperse funds where all of your, your board members sign um, the budget and then the PBQ. And so it might be helpful during the presentation to kind of go back and look at that form if, you, if it's hard to see if you're on the screen. Okay, so starting with the PBQ. This is our standard form we use. And many of you, if you've been doing this for any amount of time, are familiar with this form. This is the form we use for each payment so that we can get the basic information that we need from you to make sure that uh, the payment is applied correctly to the correct account um, and that it is um, and, and that it has a proper authority. One thing that I uh, wanted to reiterate on, on these payments is that um, you'll see there it has the it has the fund line and the, um, the agency and the, and the organization. Um, two that I wanted to draw your attention to, uh, the circled ones there, I don't know if you can see them, but there's, there's the object code, that's our expense line. Okay, and, and that's primarily where it, which you're gonna be paying out. That's the, when we talk about the account that you're paying out, it's that line, that, that line there right in the center of the page. Then the next, the one further over is the balance sheet account. And sometimes if you have a, have a, um, a loan or something outstanding like that, you might be paying out a balance sheet account, right? Something that you set aside to make periodic payments on. Um, one thing to note on this that, that sometimes is an issue that we that comes up in our office is the vendor code. Um, we'll send them out to you, your, your list of vendors. We, we will send a, a, a set of vendors for each district. And so make sure that when you're when you're telling us who to pay, you, you use the correct vendor code. And if you need that list, see me after, or uh, or you can always email Rhonda. Um, I'm gonna leave some business cards here too. Um, and you can email Rhonda or Janet, or just call the main line, and we'll we'll provide that information for you. So just be careful about the between the vendor, the right vendor mm -hmm. information. Okay, so uh, the order to disperse is fairly straightforward. This is you as the board, if you're a board member. How many of you, um, one kind of difference, how many of you are, are board members? Okay, one more than half. And then how many of you are either also or, or only um, like the manager or secretary that one paying the bills? Okay, all right. All right, so this is kind of where you two meet. Um, the order to disperse is where we want, as the auditor, we have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that the assets we hold in trust are safeguarded. And so when a manager or secretary who's been delegated that authority sometimes or sometimes not to make these payments to these vendors, this is where we want this sheet because we want to see that the board has authorized these transactions and that the, that the manager or the secretary um, is an act unilaterally, right? So 
And sometimes I know that it's a small district, and 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 sometimes that could be an issue. But for the most part, uh, this this process has been running very smoothly, and we're very pleased with it, and and hope that that you guys are too. Um, so that, that kind of speaks for itself. We're just looking for the board's authorization of these transactions. Yes, sir. So all these processes for the county uh, to disperse the funds, right? Correct. So those districts who have revenue, they disperse themselves. They don't have to come to you with a random list, right? Are you saying, um, if I'm hearing correctly, you're saying that the the, the certain vendor, do certain districts? Uh, the Hashim district has its own revenue source, so does the Hashim district have to give you the list of vendors or not? If you're, if, you're, if your district is not already involved in, in doing business with us in, in that way, of doing all those purposes, because some districts have, have a different, um, different relationship with us. Is that what you're saying? Some just, in your district, you, you do your own stuff and you're not using this? Is that what you're saying? That was a clarification question. I did presence here at the hospital district. And I want to know, you said that we have to give you the vendor list. Do we have to do that? No, the vendor list is, is something that through um, payments over time we've accumulated that we have that we can send to you if if you aren't sure which number our internal number to use for the vendor. Does that make, is that clear? It's a list that we have from doing business with you that we can send to you if it's something that's unclear to you. So it's not something you have to necessarily provide to us none. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Um, okay, so the next one uh, I want to talk to you about is the budget and preparing the budget. Each year, uh, I think around May, we usually send these out and um, and the thing about the budget, if you worked in private industry, you know, you just you, you have your budget and you, and you pay your bills and you just kind of have to watch those things. In government, it's different. We put the budget into the journal and it has its own journal, the budget journal. And so when you give us your budget, we key that into the system, we put it in, and it has... Go ahead, ma'am. I can't hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, I'll be right up on this mic. <laughs> when when you give us, when you submit a budget each year, we put that budget into the accounting system so that it limits your spending to what you have told us you are going to spend in each category. Okay, so in a sense you are bound, the district is bound to the plan, the budget that it's made for the year. That becomes an issue during the year, if you say want to spend um, more in services, or, or excuse me, if you if you're overspending your budget, then we are going to ask you to to modify the budget to increase it, if you have adequate cash reserves to 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 do that. Okay, so um, just th those are kind of some of the issues that come with the budget. Um, and I'll cover that a little more later. Um, the reports that we send out each month to the districts, there are several there. Some of the reports are available online. How, how many of you the districts have, have internet access? Most? Some? How many, okay, how many do not? Or how many don't have, aren't, aren't, aren't able to get the reports online? Okay, a couple. So, um, regardless, we send out all, there should only be seven that top one, you don't need to worry about that top one, I don't know how to go in. Um, <clears throat> but we send out all seven of those reports each month, unless, of course, some of the districts have said, okay, we can go ourselves and get the ones that are online. That's, the ones that are online are those three that are um, second to the bottom, so the VA, 103, the uh, 203, and the A614. So that's the trial balance. 
which is your balance sheet counts and, and, your, and, and where you're at positionally and the um, revenues and expenses. Those we put online each month. Now, like I said, but the rest of them we will send out to you or if you haven't told us, we'll, we'll send all of those to you monthly. Um, one thing I wanted to note here that sometimes becomes an issue is when you have an external auditor that comes out and you're in the process of an audit, these reports become very important. And sometimes uh, we'll get the phone call from the district that they need these reports. So it's a good idea to keep all the reports that we send to you so that the detail is there and available for the auditor and you don't have to wait on us to get that covered. Yes, sir. Um, I, I think at this point it might be important to, to make a distinction between those districts that have funds on deposit with the county and, and run all this through the county and those districts that do not. Sure. How, how many of you are running your accounts payable through the county? Okay, good number. And so the rest of you aren't. Okay. Um, yeah. So the, of, of course, uh, this this much more this is much more applicable to you. Those that are running your payables through the county. Okay. Um, one of the reports that I wanted to highlight because it does become an issue. Um, after the year closes is the summary trial balance and it's hard to see I know but on the far right there that's the ending cash balance now if you've been doing it for any number of years you're aware that July through about January when we closed the books but we have not yet completed the audit and and closed in the, the revenues and expenses into the balance that number is not accurate you, what needs to be done is you have to take June 30th's cash, ending cash balance, and add it to the July's cash balance, to the August, September, October, November, December, January, until the cash, until all the transactions close in and we, and we process our year-end process. And if you have more questions, like I said, you can always call the office, but that isn't, that becomes an issue um, sometimes, but once you've done it for a year, uh, most districts seem to seem to kind of catch on to how that report works. Okay. Um, we covered some of this, but I um, uh, just want to kind of highlight here that that fourth point, ensure to balance the budget form on the last page, entering any residual balance as a contingency. We, we ask you to do that. It makes things easier to, um, when you submit your budget, if you have 100000 in revenue and 80000 in expenses, and you have um, 100,000 in cash. Well, that's 100,000 in cash plus 100,000 in revenue is going to be 200,000 minus the 80,000 in uh, expenses. So you're going to have another 120,000 left. So we we ask you to put that in contingency to bring it to zero, um, so that we can see that you, you've accounted for everything. It's kind of a check for us to make sure that everything's been accounted for. So. Um, and we send out the instructions with the budget and all these forms. And like I said, if, if at any time anything's unclear to you, always feel free to call our office and we'll be more than happy to, to help you walk you through it. Um, amending the budget, this comes into play sometimes, like I said, at the end of the fiscal year when districts uh, may have run out of budget. And what we will, uh, for those districts that are processing the payables through the county, we will limit. Um, the payment's going out, so if you are out of budget, we'll be giving you a phone call. So I would encourage you to, to watch your budget and to see if, um, especially towards those last few months of the fiscal year, to make sure that you have adequate budget to cover the remaining expenses for the year. Okay. Um, and kind of over hearing vouchers. Um, see, this is nothing new as uh, our deadline to make sure that you get a payment. So, for instance, if you want payments to go out next week, you'll need to get them to our office by this Friday at 5 p.m. That's, that's our deadline so that we can have checks ready for you the following Thursday. We've had that for a long time, so like I said, those of you who've been doing business with us are aware of that. Just want to 
uh, reminder. Maintaining adequate cash. Um, this sometimes can become an issue for for districts. Um, it kind of goes without saying, but it's it's similar to the budget in that if you don't have adequate budget, we will hold the payments until until you can um, increase the budget. And this, because, like I said, um, the manager may say, "Oh, these are payments; these are added, these are uh, authorized payments," but the board designated this much to spend in the year, so we're going to ask that same level of authority, the board, to um, modify the budget or increase the budget. The same is true with the cash. If um, your cash is at a level where the payments going out are going to bring the cash into a negative position, we will also be contacting your district to bring in more cash or, or hold the payments until, until we do. Like a bank, we're not going to issue payments without cash. Okay, so um, that's really it. Um, just kind of review, like I said, um, the forms. Those are those are the main forms. Um, the reports and, and, and budget. Um, if you have any questions, like I said, you can call our office. You can call Rhonda uh, or Janet in our office. Some of you probably are, already have a relationship with them. And um, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Yes, sir. I have a complicated question. What would be the total amount of budget you are managing for all the districts payable that cost it to you? Mm. 20 million, 50 million, 100 million. For all the districts combined? Um, yeah, that way that you can pay the bills. Couldn't tell you. Yeah, it's probably, I know it's in probably the because some, some of the districts are very large, like if you add in the water districts, uh, being like a hundred, hundreds of millions. Yeah, five hundred million. Yeah, five hundred million. Yeah, I don't know if you I, I, I couldn't tell you right off the bat, but yeah, in the hundreds of millions, probably. Now, the, the districts that we do a regular, regular business with, um, it's much smaller than that, maybe. A couple, maybe a couple million dollars worth of when you're talking the school districts and everything else, we have 1.2 billion in the treasury today. Okay, that's not their budget, so it's not much cash we have. So you're talking a lot of money. Schools and special districts. Right. Okay. Government has all the money. Pardon? Government has all the money. I understand. And the question was that, as pertaining to this particular discussion on budget, how much county is processing for the special district? That was my question. If you, if you want to follow up, I can get you the exact number. Yeah. Well, I, like I said, I'm not sure. Right, right in the hundreds of millions. Four or five hundred million. Okay. Thank you. So, um, next, is Emily. next we have Emily from Elections Office. Good evening. Um, my name is Emily Oliveira, and I'm the Deputy Election Supervisor with the Tulare County Elections Office. And tonight I'm going to be presenting on uh, special districts filing for election and also filling a vacancy. Um, for your convenience, I've also included appendix pages at the back of my presentation. And anytime I'm refer referencing a form, I'll go ahead and include that reference page for you. Um, First up, we have uh, the requirements of the district. Um, on April 1st, the elections office will send out a district packet to each special district office. Um, the packet will include an incumbent verification form, a resolution, candidate filing notice, and a district map verification. Uh, the district packet is sent to your offices early so that you have enough um, time and an opportunity to plan your board meeting so that you can have the resolution passed and return to our office by the requested date of July 1st. Um, the incumbent verification form um, 
the elections office will supply a list of incumbents that we have on file um, as of that time. Um, we'll also include an appointed board member director information sheet, which is available on the appendix page three. Uh, this um, sheet can, um, will be used to, once you receive our list, you'll verify the accuracy of our list. If for some reason you had an appointment during the uh, term of the office or something's not correct on our appointment list, you'll use that form to let us know that our information is incorrect. Making sure that we have the correct incumbent on file will help us to make sure that the deadlines close appropriately or an extension period will apply if necessary. Um, as I mentioned, return all the completed forms with your resolution by July 1st. Uh, the resolution is pretty much straightforward. A sample is provided on uh, Appendix 4 through 6. Um, adopting the resolution um, allows you to request and um, consent to the consolidation of your, uh, your election with uh, all the other elections that might be occurring during that time frame. Um, and it sets forth the specifications of the election order to be um, had for that uh, election. Another form is the candidate filing notice. This is an informational form that we'll go ahead and supply to you. It has all of the important dates for your uh, officers to go ahead and file, um, nomination period, declaration period. It has instructions on how to get to our office. It also includes a reminder uh, that all candidates need to file FEPC Form 700, um, Statement of Economic Interest. Having uh, a completed Form 700 at the time of filing will help your candidates have a smoother and um, less condensed time um, and experience filing their paperwork in their office. Form 700s are available at the FPPC website, that's the Fair Political Practices Commission, and that website, available on the appendix page 9, is www.fppc.ca.gov. Uh, the F form 700 along with all of the other FPPC forms are also available and can be obtained from the elections office. The district verification, the district map verification um, will be included. Um, new this year, uh, we're going to actually supply a map to you in your district packet and ask you to confirm the boundaries of your district as we have it on file. In years past, we've asked that you please supply the district map to us. Um, but from experience and learning from um, other processes, we feel that most of the time the map isn't always supplied, and so we're um, hoping that by supplying the map to you and asking for verification, that um, we can confirm your boundaries. This uh, will help the elections office ensure that all of the voters entitled to vote in your district will actually receive a ballot. And with that, this concludes the filing, um, special districts filing for election portion. Up next, I have the filling of vacancy portion. This section contains many references to government codes on the page nine of the appendix. I've supplied a website where you can go and look up the actual government code um, if you feel so inclined. Um, we'll go ahead and cover the different types of districts as well as the two types of procedures for filing for a vacancy. Um, one scenario is no, no one runs for uh, the office when it's open for nomination, and the other is when a vacancy occurs during the term of the office. We'll also cover the 60-30 rule. Um, the first type of district is an, an appointed district. Appointed districts as it implies, um, are always appointed by the Board of Supervisors or the um, appointing authority, um, which in some cases might be like a city council or something along those lines, um, but those are appointed districts. And elected districts um, have their board, of, uh, board members elected um, either by a voter district or a landowner district. And how you fill a vacancy will depend on which type of um, special district that you are. If you're an appointed district, then the procedures are really quite simple. 
Um, you contact your appointing authority, which is usually the Board of Supervisors, and you advise the Board of Supervisors of the resignation effective date, and then you wait for the appointing authority to take action, and that's all you have to do. Um, as um, an appointed district, if your appointing authority doesn't take action, and it's not the Board of Supervisors, there is a provision um, in Government Code 1779 that allows for the Board of Supervisors to um, make an appointment to a vacancy where an appointing authority failed to take action within 90 days. For the elected district, uh, there's two types of vacancies uh, that can become available. In the first situation, no one runs for the position when the office is open for elect election. Um, and the other is when the position becomes vacant during the term of the office. The first responsibility for your district is going to be to determine which type of uh, vacancy that you have. In the first vacancy situation, the uh, filing period closes and the election office um, notifies the Board of Supervisors that nobody filed. Uh, the Board of Supervisors then may appoint a qualified person from that district to fill that board seat. And then uh, please note that the Board of Supervisors has a deadline to appoint someone to the vacant seat. Uh, they have to make that appointment during their last board meeting before the start of the term. And so the start of the term is the first Friday in December. So usually the Board of Supervisors has to complete that um, appointment by their um, last board meeting in November. <coughs> uh, when no one runs for the office that the Board of Supervisors fail to act, um, the position is deemed vacant as of the first Friday of December, and that would then follow the next um, form of vacancy when there's a vacancy during the term. Um, when the vacancy during the term occurs, the Government Code 1780 will most likely apply to most special districts. Um, Government Code 1780 is quite long, so I'll spend the next couple of slides trying to summarize that for you. And if you ever wish to reference the Government Code 1780 on your own, again, there's that website on um, Appendix Page 9. Government Code 1780 uh, essentially says that the district has 60 days to appoint somebody to a vacancy or call for an election. If the district fails to act within that 60 day time frame, the Board of Supervisors has the next 30 days to order the district to call an election or to fill the vacancy themselves. And if no action is taken within that initial 90 days by either the Board of Supervisors or the Board of the Special District, then the Board of Supervisors must make a Special District call for an election to fill that vacancy. So when does the clock start for your 90 days? The accumulative 90 days starts when one of two conditions are met. Um, the first one is when the district board is notified of the vacancy. And the second condition is when the effective date of the vacancy occurs. And you determine which one applies based on whichever is later. As an example, if an incumbent passes away, say on a Monday, and the family doesn't uh, notify the special district office until Thursday, then the district has from that Thursday 60 days to go ahead and either make an appointment or call for an election. But if a board member submits a one month notice on the first of the month, indicating their effective resignation date as the 30th of, of the month, then the 90 days starts on the 30th, or on the 30th day of the month which is the effective date of the vacancy. The second example leads us to Government Code 1750, which outlines the proper way to submit a resignation. First of all, a resignation has to be in writing, and it has to be submitted to the clerk of the board of the supervisors or the um, corresponding appointing body's uh, representative. It also must list the effective date 
and in some cases it may be deferred for up to 60 days. Events causing a vacancy are listed in Government Code Section 1770. It's an extremely long list, but the most common uh, causes of vacancy are death, resignation, and moving outside of the district which you are serving. Continuing on with the steps that outline in Government Code 1780, after the clock starts counting the 90 days, the special district must um, notify the elections official within 15 days um, after they were notified that an election has occurred, and they also must send a notice um, to the Board of Supervisors. This will allow us to keep an eye on the vacancy and make sure that uh, it's appointed or filled within the 60-day time period and make sure that we don't have to take action within the following 30 days. <coughs> Once the special district has notified the elections office and board of supervisors, their 60 days continues and the district will then have to appoint somebody or they can call for the election to occur. If the district board decides to make an appointment, then you must notify, um, you must post a notice in three conspicuous locations throughout your district indicating that you have a vacancy um, before you can appoint a board member. If you fail to comply with that notice posting, then any appointment that you wish to make cannot happen uh, because you fail to meet the requirements of posting. <coughs> If after posting your public notice you find that you have a plethora of interested candidates for the appointment, then the Brown Act has a clause which allows you to use an ad hoc committee composed solely of less than a quorum of board members to discuss applicants and then recommend the finalists to your full board to take a vote on. Once the district board has narrowed down a candidate to appoint to the office, the district must still do the following. They must contact the elections office to make sure that the applicant um, considered for appointment is a registered voter and residing in the district. They must also um, take the action to appoint that member after they've confirmed their eligibility. And then they must notify the elections office within 15 days after the appointment. And you'll also want to go ahead and send a notice, a copy of that notification to the Board of Supervisors. If the district's 60 days have passed and no action was taken, then the board does, um, then the appointing authority has 30 days to appoint someone or order to the district to call an election. Um, at that point in time, you'll want to make sure that you notify the elections office as well as the Board of Supervisors that you have passed your 60-day mark and that you're requesting the Board of Supervisors to take action um, because if we don't receive the appointment of the notice of appointment for your candidate, then we'll be calling your district and asking for that and then at that point in time, you'll have to go ahead and notify us that you are relying on the Board of Supervisors to take that action. So, um, and it helps the board to under, uh, realize that they have to take action as well. If for whatever reason, both the district and the appointing authority are unable to take action within the allotted 90 days, then the district has no other option and they must call an election to fill the vacancy. If you have appointed a candidate to fulfill a vacancy, how long does the appointee hold office? Um, if the vacancy occurs within the first half of the term and at least 130 days before the next district election, then the position is held until the next uh, general election for that office, um, not to exceed two years. At that midterm point for the short term office, uh, the appointed incumbent may in fact run for that office again and the winner of that election will then take the remaining of that term until the next um, scheduled election for that um, office. But if the vacancy occurs within the second half of the original office holder's term, then the appointed candidate can then go ahead and fulfill the remainder of that term without needing to have a short-term election halfway through. 
there is a special rule um, for a no quorum. If um, you have a number of vacant, a number of uh, resignations or vacancies on your board, and you no longer have a quorum, then the board of supervising or corresponding appointing authority will go ahead and appoint members to fill those vacancies until there is enough members on the board to make a quorum, and then the regular rules for a vacancy will go ahead and apply. The Board of Supervisors or other appointing authority must appoint or elect, um, must, um, sorry, will limit the number of appointees to enough members to fill the quorum. And um, with that, that is all that I have for um, special districts filing and how to fill a vacancy. Um, we also included the Tillery County Registrar of Voters webpage because it has a lot of um, guides and reference books to help you with how to fill a vacancy and other common procedures that need help with. Thank you. Government. Uh, again, my name is Mara Erickson. I'm with County Council. I've been uh, with County Council for a couple of years. I've been an attorney for about 10 years. Um, and uh, this is one of the areas uh, that I am assigned to at the County Council's office. So I'm sort of the second, uh, in, second in command when it comes to the Brown Act. So, and, I'm pretty well versed, and if you have any questions uh, at the end or during, just feel free to raise your hand. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. You can hear me back there? Okay. Uh, so first of all, um, what is it? As I said, it's about um, open meetings. It's about giving notice to the public uh, about what the, the board is doing and making sure that the public is able to participate in, in government. Um, and why is it important? Uh, it's because the government is supposed to be representing the people, elected by the people, uh, and the public needs to be able to observe, monitor, and evaluate its elected representatives. Um, and so, as a result of concerns from the public of not, you know, of backroom dealings and such, um, over time, this, this has evolved to protect the public's right to know what their government is doing. Um, so, the question obviously next is, does the Brown Act apply to you? Um, and it applies to all local government agencies. Um, and I told you in the, in the PowerPoint presentation, which you have, that that is defined as the county, city, whether general law or charter, city and county, town, school district, municipal corporation, district, political subdivision, or any board, commission, or agency thereof, or other local public agency. So in other words, most likely, yes, the Brown Act does apply to you. Um, and so the governing bodies of all the, of all the above, all the boards, committees, and bodies created by federal and state law. Um, yes, in the back. Does the Brown Act have anything to do with the uh, organization that runs under 501 uh, It depends if, if that's a, a nonprofit organization. Um, there are very select corporations that the Brown Act applies to. Um, most of the time we're talking about government agencies here, so um, I'm not really familiar with when it applies to nonprofit corporations. Um, Is it a nonprofit, uh, I guess, football league? No. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear. Do you have a microphone? Thank you. I 
believe it's a nonprofit uh, football organization. Um, you know, I unless it's uh, somehow has to do with the government um, or a local agency, then it probably is a, a private nonprofit. Um, but I'm sorry, I don't I don't really know about about that. Um, I do reference that there is a there's a small section of corporations where it does apply, and I'm I'm not sure if I have an example in here or the details of it. Um, I can if you give me your information at the end, I can um, look into it and get back to you on that. Yes. So College of Sequoia has the foundation, and that is tied up with the College of Sequoia, which is a foundation in the district. Then that foundation entity uh, has to go through public announcement or not really? Um, a foundation that has to do with College of Sequoia? Right, or, or for a hospital or for any other community college or foundation. Um, it, not necessarily because that might be a foundation that is um, not put together by the governing board of the college or the hospital district. Um, and so if it's like a volunteer or a separate foundation that raises money for the hospital but isn't controlled by the hospital, um, it would probably be a, a different situation. Um, so for my, most of my focus is on government agencies. Did you have anything? If it has the same board, would it? If it had the same board, it would have its own complications. Just a second. Um, because obviously that board is covered by the Brown Act, and then if they're all meeting at a separate board somewhere else, then they're going to run into issues as the other board, but not so much because they're on another on a foundation board. Yes, we have another question? Local uh, water districts. In yes. The Senate water districts. They are covered with their visa all over the land. Um, water districts, yes, and as opposed to like just private. Um, Is it a private water district? Like a mutual water company? Or? Yes, ma'am. Um, I should have been prepared for that question, and I'm not. I apologize. Um, the, let me see if I have the. There, as I said, there there is a sec, a section where um, the corporation acts like a public agency, and so I think it might apply there. But let me just give me a moment here and see if I have it in my reference materials again. Since I'm, I'm guessing that that's a question that a lot of people have. And I apologize again for... Okay, so um, the governing body of a private entity is um, considered a legislative body if it was either created by a legislative body to exercise properly delegated authority, so as I said, if the board of um, the hospital district created this other body, um, or if it receives funds from the local agency and its governing body includes a member of the legislative body of the local agency. So I'm thinking that, no. Um, because it's it's not been created by a legislative body unless unless that's not the case and there's a special case for it. Um, but if you wouldn't mind giving me your contact information at the end, I just want to double check that I'm giving the right answer. Okay, so let's see. Again, uh, um, as Emily mentioned, uh, it, typically you would have the Brown Act applying to subcommittees of, you know, uh, or joint subcommittees. But it, as long as as long as the subcommittee is comprised of less than a quorum of the of the body above it, 
and it's an ad hoc body, the Brown Act doesn't apply. So as she was saying, in a situation where um, you've received a lot of uh, applications for an appointment, and the board creates an ad hoc subcommittee to just review the applications and come up with a recommendation, that's not going to be a Brown Act body. If, however, you, the board created a standing subcommittee that always did a certain thing and advised the board about it, then it would be covered by the Brown Act. Any questions about that? Yes? Do you have the board of supervisors uh, in preparation of the agenda like a week before the meeting? Uh, usually there is a preparatory meeting before the uh, agenda is decided, is that right? Um, not necessarily. What happens is that from beforehand, usually there's a meeting with the chairman of the board and maybe the CAO and county council to discuss what is actually already on the agenda. Um, but it's not the full board. If it was the full board or a quorum of the board, it would be a, a problem. Okay, so that preparatory meeting that you just mentioned, is that covered by Brown Act or not? It's not because it, it's not a meeting of the uh, it's not a meeting of the board. But it is regularly scheduled, right? It is, um, but because there isn't a quorum, it's okay. Or really, and it's not a majority either. Yeah. Um, <coughs> So then I have my little shark here who's going to bite you if you don't follow the brown act. That's, I don't like clip art too much, but I enjoy those kind of things. Um, so the compliance with the brown act can be enforced by a civil lawsuit. Um, a court can declare board actions void if they were uh, not in compliance with the brown act. Um, an agency can be liable for significant costs and attorney's fees, and there can be an issue um, with uh, a civil rights issue, so you always want to be considerate of that as well. Uh, there are also criminal penalties, um, and a violation may be a misdemeanor if um, there's wrongful intent. So if you're intentionally um, hiding something from the public, that could be a misdemeanor. So again, the Brown Act has to do with open meetings, public access, and public participation. Uh, they want there no secret backroom deals. Um, and the Brown Act establishes the rules and procedures um, to make sure that the decision-making bodies um, are you know, accessible, open to the public, and they're acting in the public's eye. Um, it also provides the means and procedures for the public to be informed about what's going to happen, um, who's making what decision on the board, who's voting for what, etc. Okay, um, so what is a meeting? Um, and according to the statute, it's, it's any congregation of a majority of the members. Um, of the legislative body, whether they are meaning to hear, discuss, deliberate, or take action on any item within their subject matter jurisdiction. So, it doesn't matter if there's a majority of the board, say it's a water board, and um, or uh, water district, excuse me, and the board of the water district, a majority of them get together, and they're not gonna take any action, they're not even going to necessarily talk about anything, but they're going to hear from one person present about some issue that's of concern to them. That would be a Brown Act meeting. Even though they don't talk about it, even though they don't take any action, they're still hearing it, and the public wasn't noticed and told that they could be there to hear the same information that the board is getting. So it's so it's pretty strict in that regard. It's, it's very concerned with the public knowing what the board knows, hearing what the board hears, hearing what the board has to say, participating and giving their two cents about what the board is about to do. Um, so again, and it has to do with this, it, it matters what they're talking about. If it's a majority of this same water district board, 
they're talking about Disneyland, it's fine. But be careful because somebody sees that board together at lunch, they don't know you're talking about Disneyland, they might start raising a question about whether you accidentally talked about water, etc. Okay, so exceptions to the meeting. Oh, yes, in the back. Can you get in the back? So you have a broken pipe and you have three board members there figuring out how to fix it. Have you violated the brown? Um, <laughs> probably not because that's not exactly the subject matter jurisdiction. I mean, if, it is a, if it's a pipe that is a part of the water system that the water district I mean, you know, there are exceptions for emergencies and stuff, but probably you want to have one of those members um, step, back. step back and not be there. Yeah, and um, you know, even we, we uh, on our team, we had a training at the emergency services not a while back, and we said, well, if there's a huge emergency, doesn't every member of the board come down here and want to know what's going on? And we said, no, they will actually find out who's going to be here and make sure that they're not all here at the same time. So it is. It sometimes can almost defy um, common sense or logic, but it's, it's because it's such a slippery slope of not including the public. You have to err on the side of caution. So uh, some of the exceptions are uh, for conferences and trainings and workshops, um, community forums, attending other meetings of other government bodies. Um, again, you probably don't want to be too. Uh, participating too much, um, you don't want to give the appearance also of, of violating the Brown Act. Um, social or ceremonial occasions. Uh, um, staff can meet individually with the majority of the board members, but one at a time. But they can't then dis you can't discuss what the other board member told that staff person. So that would be considered a serial meeting which is not acceptable. So you can't have one staff member go, okay, what do you think? Okay, John thinks this, what do you think? Okay, John and Liz think this, what do you think? Okay, John and Joe think this, Liz, what do you think? And kind of get a consensus that way because that still violates the Brown Act, even though they didn't all meet together. Uh, so again, serial meetings are not okay. Um, that's a series of communications between individuals affecting a discussion, um, like polling for consensus. And I say on here, beware of emails, because when you start hitting reply all to emails, then you start having a discussion that's not involving the public, and you can be violating the run out there. OK, so rules for the meetings that are for brown act bodies. Um, they must be noticed in advance. The meetings must only include the business described in the agenda um, with, you know, there's a little bit of wiggle room there for public comment, um, but that can't then be acted on or really discussed. Um, the meetings have to take place within the agency's boundaries, and they have to be completely accessible by the public. So what is not an illegal meeting, attorney-client communication, one-way communication by staff to a solitary board member. Um, and as I said before, board members may individually cons cons confer with constituent staff, consultants, and colleagues. Um, just to go back here, I think I, I talk more about public participation and what's on the agenda, so we'll get that in. Um, Yes. How about employee issues or personnel issues? Personnel issues are, um, I'm going to discuss that a little bit further on, but those are one of the times that there can be a closed session of the board. Um, closed sessions do have to be agendized um, or put on the agenda, but with limited information. Um, so that's one of those things where there's a, obviously an interest in the public not knowing everything that goes on. Um, so I will talk about that a little bit later, but that is, there are situations when the board can meet in a closed session not open to the public to discuss certain specific things. And I will talk more about that. Okay, so the notice, 
Um, and I'm sorry that I, I'm kind of reading some of these slides. I want to be precise. Um, so I fill in where I can, but with some of the things that I want to make sure that I'm telling you exactly right and I'm not missing anything. So um, you need to post the agenda 72 hours in advance. It needs to be in, a, in an accessible location. It needs to be mailed to the persons that have requested mailed notice. If you maintain a website, you need to post it on your website. Special meetings may be called by posting an agenda at least 24 hours before the meeting. Excuse me, and a written notice to the board and some media is required. So. <clears throat> okay, so the agenda itself has to tell you the time, tell the time and the place of the meeting. And most, um, most governing bodies have a regular time and place set. Um, it has to have a brief but clear description of every item that's going to be discussed. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, including the closed session items. So as I was saying, you still have to mention that you're going to go into closed session about uh, a particular matter, but that's, that can even be limited how much information you give out there. Um, it must include a time for general public comment about things that are not on the agenda. Um, and then, and I'll talk I think a little bit more about this later, but also every specific item ultimately you have to give the public a chance to talk about if they want to. Yes, in the back. How about if there's an emergency uh, situation where you've got a big water leak that needs to be taken? Yes, so there can be there can be emergency. Um, I'll get that in a couple of slides, I think. But are you allowed to make uh, the secretary allowed to make a phone call and get a vote by the members? Probably not. In that situation, there should probably be somebody that's already authorized to make like a quick call or they got to put together a quick board meeting where everybody gets together. Um, I'm sorry? Right. I'm going to get to it in just a couple of slides. If you can just give me a moment and see if I answer your question. Um, so, as I was saying, you have to include a time for general public comment, and then it has to have um, some what we call magic words uh, somewhere on the actual agenda, letting people know that, um, they, that if they need special accommodation to be able to attend the meeting, that that can be provided and how to come through the contact to get the special accommodation, and then also how they can obtain uh, items that were distributed to the board after the agenda packet went out. Okay, um, I keep skipping here. Adding items to the agenda after posting. So uh, you can do so in certain situations. Um, emergencies, an urgent need to take action or an item was continued. Um, in, hold on a second here. I want to make sure that it didn't light you and tell you I was going to talk about something I'm not talking about. Okay, we'll get back to that. Um, so if you are going to have a meeting and you need to uh, add something to the meeting agenda, you can do so if it's an emergency, if there's an urgent need to take action, or if the item was not on the agenda because it was continuing to be an earlier date. Um, the most likely addition to an agenda is going to be an urgent item. Um, and then two conditions both have to be met. Um, you have to need to take immediate action, and uh, no one at the county can have known about the item until after the agenda was posted. So it can't be that someone just forgot to put it on the agenda. Um, what? Yes, except that doesn't address the, um, there wasn't even a meeting scheduled. And, um, so I don't have an answer for you on the how to call an emergency meeting. Um, so 
So I'll have to get I'll have to get back to you on that because I know that there are ways to call an emergency meeting um, for just those reasons that you stated. Um, you know, some some urgency, urgency happens and they need to call an emergency meeting to deal with it. Um, but I'm sorry, off the top of my head, I cannot remember what they are. Um, and um, okay, so I'm gonna. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that one. Um, so again, the procedure for adding the urgent item. Those the board has to actually find both of the. Um, that both that the item is urgent and that no and that nobody knew about it until after the agenda was already posted. Then they have to approve by a two thirds vote, actually adding the item to the agenda. And then um, once those votes have been taken, then they can actually talk about the urgency item. An alternative to adding something as an urgency item is to hold a special meeting, but that also requires 24 hours notice, so that doesn't, that's not quite as, um, that still doesn't address the absolute instant emergency situation that uh, the gentleman in the back is talking about. But it's still, um, if you have 24 hours, you can schedule a special meeting. Um, and even if you have um, 24 hours before the regular board meeting, you can add the special meeting, schedule it for right after the regular meeting, and then hold the, you know, uh, deal with the special meeting issues right after the regular board meeting. Um, sorry, I was so hot up here. <laughs> um, okay, so then access to the public, uh, access by the public to the board packet. The uh, open session materials must be made available to the public as soon as they're available to the board. Yes? She's coming with the mic for you. When having a special meeting, what items can and cannot be talked about in a special meeting? Is it, you cannot talk about, like, um, like for a water board, liquid accounts. Um, what would an item be on the special meeting? That is another excellent question that I did not anticipate, and I do not know the answer to. I'm sorry, I feel very embarrassed right now. Um, luckily, we have all of your contact information, so if I need to send out a little memo answering all these questions, I can, uh, because I don't know, um, I don't know that it's particularly limited, except that I don't think you can have a closed session in special meeting, but I will need to get back on that. Okay. Um, so again, most meetings have to be held within the uh, agency's jurisdiction. Um, there are certain exceptions, like uh, sometimes the board goes to Washington, D.C., the Board of Supervisors, or um, if you were going to inspect real property. Now, those are exceptions to um, having to meet within the jurisdiction, but they are not exceptions to the Brown Act. So those meetings are still agendized, still open to the public, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So really, even if the whole board is going to uh, inspect a building that they're thinking about buying, um, the public has a right to go and be there with them. Um, so this is, this probably should be um, obvious, but uh, the board can't meet in any facility that prohibits the admittance of any person on the basis of race, national origin, ethnic group identification, religion, etc. Um, you can't meet in a place where certain members of the public are not allowed to go. Um, you can't meet in a place where uh, people who need um, disabled access cannot get access. Um, or where the public has to make a purchase in order to stay there. So, if you were to meet at a restaurant, you'd have to make sure that the public could be there without having to buy dinner or even a coffee. 
Um, so as far as long distance participation, some people have asked about calling into meetings, etc. cetera. Um, teleconferencing can be authorized if it's prearranged, but the weird thing about it is that the public has to be able to also be at the place where the person is calling in from. So um, you can't just call in from your car um, and attend the meeting. The public has to be able to be at the same place as the person calling in. So I mean, I guess if you were um, going to prearrange it and you were going to be um, just in a remote location in the county or something, and then maybe other people that wanted to participate in the meeting but couldn't because they also are in a remote location in the county could then be there too and participate um, through the telephone. But it's not as easy as just arranging, like I'm not going to be there, so I'm going to call in from my cell phone wherever I happen to be at the time. Um, as I said. Okay. Uh, again, they have to be open to the public. The location has to be on the agenda. Agenda must be posted at each location. So, you know, like I'm going to be calling in from uh, wherever you have to have known ahead of time that was going to be where you're calling in from and posted the agenda there too. So it's, it's pretty cumbersome. Um, it doesn't, it's not like an easy, just quick fix if you can't make it to the meeting call. Okay, uh, so again, all meetings must be open to the public unless uh, the closed session is authorized, and I will talk a little bit more about closed session. Uh, do we need a break or can we power through to the end of my presentation? Looking okay? Um, all members of the public must be allowed to attend. You may not require members of the public to identify themselves. Um, you can ask, but you can't require it. Um, and a sign-in sheet must state that signing in is voluntary. You must allow recording. Uh, you can have disruptive attendees removed. Um, there are no secret ballots allowed. And you must publicly report out formal votes in open, in open session, and by that I mean um, when formal votes happen in closed session, you have to come out and report what the vote was and who voted for and against. Yes? Um, on the last item. Yes. Uh, you, have a, you have a board meeting that goes to the closed session to discuss financial issues. This is hypothetical, of course. Um, to discuss financial issues. They come back out of closed session and no, no report is forthcoming on the issues discussed. That's a violation. Well, not necessarily. Um, first of all, going into closed session to discuss financial issues may or may not be a violation already. We'll get to more on the closed session in a minute. Um, but if they're legitimately in closed session, and they're discussing something and they don't actually take an, a formal vote, like, okay, we're going to have a vote first, you know, someone will make a motion, someone will second it, and we're going to vote on this particular action, as opposed to saying, okay, like, let's have the staff look into it more, or, yeah, I think that's a good idea, or you guys can go ahead and authorize that. Um, if there's no formal vote taken or required, then there may not be a reporting out. Yes? Trying to narrow this down a little bit. Uh, five years of minutes of a particular board indicate, or there's consistently um, going into closed session to discuss specific financial matters. At no time during the course of the minutes of those those 60 sets of minutes, at no time. <coughs> Is there any specific information placed in the minutes or made available to the public regarding the financial issues discussed in closed session? Is that a violation of Brown Act? It uh, honestly, it depends. It depends what was on the um, agenda 
the open session agenda about the closed session, um, whether they were legitimately going into closed session on a particular issue authorized by the Brown Act to be handled in closed session, and then whether they only discussed what they were authorized to discuss in the closed session, and then whether they needed to take a formal vote and took the vote and then did or didn't uh, announce out. Um, for example, with the Board of Supervisors, we have a lot of checks and balances, safeguards, forms that we all fill out before we even get it on the closed session agenda. Um, there's a form that uh, is for Kathleen Bales Lang to be able to look at, know whether she's going to make a report out. She'll often announce, I don't anticipate a report out, or I do anticipate a report out. And that's kind of based on what she knows about what's on the agenda for the closed session. So without knowing quite a bit more detail about the situations you're referring to, I can't know. Um, I will discuss a little bit more about what is authorized to be discussed in closed session. And so if, there, if it's just like, oh, we're going to go talk about finance, you know, yeah. If, if the purpose of the Brown Act is to open up to the public matters that the public should be aware of, how how then, and, and I don't mean to be argumentative, please forgive me if I appear to be, but how then can a public entity discuss the expenditure of millions of dollars over a period of five years without disclosing it in the minutes of those meetings and have it not be a violation of the problem? It just, it just doesn't add up to me. Uh, again, and I don't know if everybody knows what you're talking about, and I don't, like a specific situation. Right. Right. Um, That's fine. But it depends, uh, again, on the circumstances of why they're discussing it. Is it a, lit a litigation um, that they're discussing? Are they just dis are they discussing um, an employee matter? Um, you know, it, it totally depends on whether they're allowed to go into closed session at all. Uh, whether they properly agendize it in the open session. So that, without knowing the specifics, and I know you can, probably can't go into it and it wouldn't be appropriate, but um, I, will, I will actually address closed session a little bit in a little bit more detail. There are specific circumstances. So if you feel that, that it doesn't fall within those circumstances, then of course that would be a problem. So I, I'm not telling you it's not. I'm not telling you that you're not t telling me about a Brown Act violation. I'm just telling you that I can't know um, just based on the facts that you've told me so far. Thank you. Okay, I mentioned this earlier. You must give the public the opportunity to comment on each agenda item. So um, some uh, boards and commissions, uh, including the Board of Supervisors, have a consent calendar where they just uh, approve a whole uh, slew of um, agenda items in one fell swoop. And that's fine as long as they've um, given the public the opportunity to pull off any particular agenda item that they want to address um, specifically. And they do that. Um, again, you uh, may adopt reasonable uh, limitations on how long a person can speak at public comment. And the Board of Supervisors has a three-minute limit. Uh, if there are comments made by the public about things that are not on the agenda, the uh, Board may briefly respond. Um, they may ask questions for clarifications and make brief announcements. Um, if something comes up at public comment that is a real concern for the board but it's not on the agenda, um, really the only uh, alternative is to then say, okay, let's put this on the agenda for our next meeting and we'll actually discuss it then. And that way everybody else that's in the public will have a chance to actually know that that's going to be discussed by the board. Um, Again, the board can make brief announcements, they can provide brief uh, reports on their activities, which if you attend board of supervisors meetings, they'll often tell you what they've been up to. 
Um, they can ask staff to report back. They can uh, refer the speaker to, to the staff or other resources. And as I said, they can ask for an item to be put on a future agenda. Whoop. Okay, so now we're coming to closed session. Um, it is narrowly authorized for specific matters. Special disclosures have to be made by the board before and after holding the closed session. Um, they cannot, in closed session, talk about things beyond the scope of what has been agendized for closed session. And I know as uh, for members of the public, it's sort of like what happens in the back, you don't know. Um, so you, this is one of the things where you have to be trusting. Um, for better or worse, and hope that they're all keeping each other in check. But the law is that they that you can't go beyond the scope of those specific um, agendized matters in closed session. So we have personnel matters. It's one reason that the, the board can go into closed session to consider the employment, evaluation of performance, discipline, or dismissal of a public employee to hear complaints or charges against an employee by another person or employee. Um, for obvious, there are obvious reasons why this wouldn't be appropriate, possibly in the public forum. Um, so this is one of those reasons why a board of a local agency is allowed to discuss it in closed session. Labor negotiations, to meet with a bargaining representative, to review the negotiating position, that's acceptable. Um, again, this would be agendized on the open session agenda as meeting with a labor negotiator. Okay, um, for litigation, um, the board will often go into closed session to meet with their attorney about um, litigation, whether it's uh, pending litigation, litigation that's already been filed, if there is a anticipate a, like a strong anticipation of litigation, um, obviously it doesn't make sense for the board of a public agency to make public um, what they think somebody might be suing them about or what their legal strategy is. So that's another reason why a board can go into closed session to discuss litigation. Um, if there are if the facts of the litigation are known to the plaintiff, there is some amount of information that needs to be placed on the open session agenda about what's going to be discussed. If the plaintiff or potential plaintiff may not know that there is even um, something being discussed, the board doesn't need to say um, anything about it. They just say that they're anticipating litigation and leave it at that. Excuse me. <laughs> With regard to real property, um, the board can discuss with the negotiator of the price and terms of, of the payment, but the weird thing about it is that they can't have closed session about the actual location of the property. So um, there's not going to be any like secret that the county is possibly buying X building where the board of this particular district is, is um, considering buying the property at this address. So, you know, if other people are then like, oh, that's interesting, I wonder why the county wants to buy that building or if that's a good price, et cetera, et cetera, the cat's out of the bag as, as far as what property they're looking at, but the actual price and negotiations, that can be discussed in closed session. Um, the other reason for closed session is the security of public facilities to meet with law enforcement or security consultants on matters posing a threat to security of public buildings, security of public services, or the public's right of access to public services or public facilities. And that's it. So for closed session, if it doesn't fall into one of those categories, um, you probably shouldn't be talking about it in closed session. Um, and if, if, you, if you are, then you need to re-examine why, why you're doing it and if it's really something that, um, 
first of all, you obviously don't want to be violating the law. Also, you want to examine the spirit of the law is to let the public know what's going on and what your thoughts are on something. And it may be frustrating to have to have these discussions in the public I, but you represent the public, and so uh, that's the way the law has sort of adjusted to err on the side of caution with regards to the public having uh, a lot of access to the thought processes of the board members and the board itself. Um, so to, to address the gentleman in the back again, the idea that there's just some closed session to discuss finance in um, just the, uh, you know, just generally some financial matters, unless it's been specifically fit into one of these um, areas, it would be problematic. Okay. Um, oh. So again, the agenda has to include a brief description of the nature of the closed session. Um, the board must disclose in open session the items that they're going back to discuss in closed session. The board must make a public report of certain actions taken in closed session. Um, except for those reports that they are required to make, everything that happens in closed session stays in closed session. Um, violations can result in a lawsuit to enforce confidentiality, etc. Any questions? All right. Now I think we do. Oh, maybe yes, yes. In closed session, can you invite who you want in to discuss the situation? How does that work? Um, staff. Um, staff will be invited. Can be invited in if they um, are needed to what inform. What is playing against uh, 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 one of the uh, manager, worker, or somebody from the outside just to come in and complain, or how does that work? No, it wouldn't involve outside parties because um, that because then you're actually getting into some kind of a due process where they're not hearing the charges against them and things like that. Um, so no, typically the only outsiders that are going to be in a closed session will be uh, council and maybe staff to give recommendations or to inform the board about the particular uh, situation. Uh, but you won't have members of the public coming in and sort of giving testimony. Yes, I have a question. Um, do you, on closed sessions, do you make motions to go into closed session and to come out of closed session? And well, we normally, normally what needs to happen is that closed session will be on the agenda, the regular old open session agenda, will have um, a section that is for closed session. The particular items that they're going to go into closed session about will be identified on the agenda. Now, those will have limited information, so the public may or may not be able to even have a real idea of what's going to be discussed. Um, however, the board can sort of urgently go into closed session if something comes up in the board meeting that triggers the ability to go into closed session. They can announce that they, they've determined that they need to go into closed session to discuss with council, et cetera. But you do want to be careful about doing that. Um, whenever, for example, with the Board of Supervisors, whenever we as council have identified anything in advance that may even bring up anything, we typically put a placeholder on the agenda to let the public know that this could go into closed session. And then if nothing comes up at the public hearing or whatever, we just take it off the agenda. Um, but typically you say, we're going into closed session to discuss the agenda items listed, you know, A, B, and C in the closed session. And then when you come out, then uh, there will be an announcement out that they discussed X, Y, and Z matters. And then if there's a specific report required by whatever action was taken in the back, then that will be announced as well. One other question is, what is the process when uh, there is a complaint on the staff member, office manager, whatever, what is the process so that we can get something, you know, we can get clarification on, if we have answers regarding certain uh, questions that you need to answer? Uh, well, that actually has a lot more to do with your policies and then employment law and things, which is not my area at all. Um, 
So in terms of how you proceed with uh, you know, employee discipline or complaints against board members, um, that's going to be um, a more of an internal policy question. And um, if you are in a district that has county council as your attorney, um, that would be the labor and employment team that you'd want to talk to. Otherwise, if you don't already have policies that have been reviewed by the attorney, you might want to, you might want to do that. Um, that doesn't really have much to do with the Brown Act until you start talking about it um, at board meetings. Yes? Regarding the public comments, do we, do we have to allow public comments on each agenda item being discussed or it can be segregated as an agenda item? It's actually both. There has to be uh, an agenda item specifically for just all public comment that's not having to do with anything on the agenda. And then for each individual agenda item, you have to allow the public to comment on each individual agenda item. Now, you can, as I said with the consent calendar, you can lump agenda items together and say, we're planning to approve or deny all of these all at once. If anybody here wants to discuss one of these, let us know now so we can pull it out of that bunch and we'll approve the rest and then you can discuss and address this one specifically. Um, so you don't have to like take each item, see if anybody has comment, take another item, see if anybody has comment because there are some that are just pretty rote um, agenda items that get, you know, that if they've already been determined they're going to be um, that they're generally just approve or deny, um, and that's fine, but there has to be an opportunity for the public to say, hey, I wanted to talk about item B or, or whatever. Does that make sense? Right. And so do we have to positively make a comment to public that if the public has a comment on the agenda item, or if they have a comment, they will make it? I would suggest that you either put it on the agenda itself, that they can um, ask staff to notify the board that they want to discuss a particular item, um, and or before you take the consent calendar, say if anybody is going to want to address one of these items specifically, then please tell us now and we'll pull that one out, um, just to be on the safe side, because otherwise you could uh, have somebody waiting to talk about an item and not quite understand what the consent calendar is, and then they've waited there the whole day, it's done, and they're, they say, wait, wait, I was I was here to talk about item C. Uh, I, I never heard anybody talk about it. Where, where's my time to talk about it? Okay, I think we do need a break now. Oh, yes, one more question? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Received in the past is 
having to come all the way to Visalia to deposit the money with the treasury. So this presentation is basically um, geared towards those districts that are based outside of the city of Visalia. And um, what we did is we set up a process about a year and a half ago to allow um, those districts outside of Visalia to make their deposits to the treasury directly with a bank in that area. We've set up contracts with both Union Bank and Bank of Sierra. Um, there are sweep accounts that are deposited in those accounts and then will sweep over into the treasurer's main account. Okay, this process is an easy process. It's as easy as one, you make a request with the treasury um, to start the service. Two, you make a deposit with your local bank. And three, we prepare the same um, cash receipt form that for the auditor's office that we're currently uh, preparing now. Okay, step one, the districts must re uh, request the service in writing. Um, there is a form that's in uh, your books towards the back section. Um, and all of it, it's a pretty simple form. It just has the contact information and some basic questions about your banking habits, about how many deposits a month you'll have and uh, the approximate size of those deposits um, and the location of the district. Um, once we're um, receiving that form, the treasury will go ahead and order uh, deposit slips and endorsement stamp that is specific to your district. So although everybody deposited the same capital deposit slips, have an encoded number on them that tells us whose money um, made, who made that deposit. And third, um, there is a small um, $90 startup cost charge for those deposit slips and uh, endorsement stamp to start the service with the banks. And those will be uh, directly charged to back to the district. Second step, um, upon receiving your deposit slips and endorsement stamp, um, you're ready to start making deposits into the bank. Um, which bank you use depend is based on location. The criteria, criteria priority basically is if you're in Visalia, you continue to deposit with the county treasurer. If there is a union bank in your area, you will deposit with union bank. And if there's no union bank, um, with Bank of Sierra. The reason Union Bank is the priority uh, bank at all possible is because that is the county's main bank and uh, the service charges are significantly cheaper through them than with the other, um, the other bank and uh, the process is a smoother process on our own. Um, this map kind of shows you where the banks are located so you get an idea um, where, um, based on where you're located which bank you'll be using. I don't know if you can see from there, but it is also in the books. But the triangle is where the county treasurer's office is located. The circles are with Union Bank, and the stars are with Bank of Sierra. And the third and final step in the process is simply to fill out the auditor's uh, cash receipt form. You fill that out. You email it or you fax it to the auditor's office. They will get it input into um, the county's accounting system. The treasurer's office, once they get um, verification that the money is in the bank, um, which usually is the following morning, because it usually goes through the nightly cycle um, of the bank, and then we get notification the following morning that that money is in the bank, then we will finalize that receipt, and your money will be in your account at the county where it will begin to go ahead and earn interest in our investment pool. Um, one last comment on that, if you deposit your money the last day of the month and you are required to show those funds in that month's um, monthly report, you might want to bring that money in. If we don't get the notification until the following day, um, our records are going to show that the money came in. It's going to be processed as of the 1st as opposed to as of the 31st. So if it's uh, very critical that that money is shown in that specifically monthly financial statement on the county's books, then you don't need to walk that deposit in. And that's um, basically it for the process. Um, 
Last section is the goals of the service, which probably should have started the presentation. Um, but I'll, I'll read some through some of the goals. Um, the goals when we started the service was one, to provide greater convenience and efficiency in the operations for the outlying areas in the county, to reduce costs associated with and time lost during travel, reduce costs and travel reimbursement claims associated with transporting deposits into mycelia, increase cash management through more frequent deposits, reduce number of vehicle miles traveled to help improve the air quality within the county. Um, and one more that should probably be added to the list now that the Fed is finally starting to raise interest rates, the sooner you have your money into the Treasury, the sooner you start receiving interest. Um, and with that, I'll just open it up to questions. Yes? Where is the interest rate? Um, this past quarter was 1.3% um, before expenses, so it's a little bit lower than that after we reduced the Treasury cost. I don't remember exactly what the costs are right now, but we are at 1.3 this past quarter. Yes? No, we will. We will continue to receive them, but um, I do want to say that during tax season, uh, um, the tax collector's office is using the lockbox, so a lot of the checks that come in, if they get miss, you know, our office and the tax collector's office are right next to each other, if that um, mailing gets mixed with theirs, it could be a couple of weeks before we actually see it. The bank will return it to us, the lockbox does return it to us, but sometimes it does take a couple of weeks before that project is done. So especially during that time if we use another process, but we will definitely continue to take mail on Yes. Any other questions during this process for the treasury? Go ahead. What were we talking about? The checks? The checks? Yeah. Mailing and checks? Well, just uh, the check itself, I guess the question I have is should there be two we have, we have signed two signatures. Should there be two lines, or is it okay to have just one line? It, and where you have to have two signatures, it is okay to just have one line. Um, and with two signatures, one above the other on that single line. The banks will take them that way. It, it might be easier to have order checks that have two lines to remind your own staff that it requires two signatures or to remind the bank to look for two signatures. Um, but, it's, but they will take it with one. Can you just tell them about that, the materials that are sort of Look, I'm not sure what was to be honest with you. Okay. In the back um, of the presentation, um, there is the uh, application authorization remote for the form that you fill out to request act, uh, to get started in the process. And there's also a user guide from that we got from Union Bank on how they want their deposits prepared. Um, the same process works for Bank of Sierra, but we got the guide provided to us from Union Bank. And for the most part, that's the same way, it's pretty close to the same way we like the deposits prepared for the Treasury as well. And then the following is just a kind of a recap of the process that was outlined in the uh, um, PowerPoint, except in more of a procedure manual type format. Any other questions regarding the treasurer's office in general or this remote location department? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Cara, Accountant, Auditor, about Special District Audit Requirements. Good evening, my name is Virginia Cara. I'm an Accountant Auditor with the Finan uh, Financial Reporting and Audits Division at the Auditor Control Office in Veracruz. Uh, today I will be talking about Special District Audit Requirements. Um, special districts are required to have an annual independent uh, audits conducted by a certified public accountant. Um, however, they may be replaced with uh, biannual or audits covering a five year period, and those would have to be approved by the Board of Supervisors. 
Um, according to the ordinance section of 26909, um, special districts should file an audit report to the state controller's office and to the county auditor within 12 months of the year years under examination. Um, when they're submitted to the county auditor, which that would be us, uh, we review them and we compile what we call the special district monitoring report, which gets uh, submitted to the board of directors and the grand jury. <coughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, the first part of my presentation is going to be on filing requirements, and I will talk about the state controllers. Um, requirements and then our requirements. So for the state controller's office, uh, your completed financial and compensation reports must be submitted within 90 days after the close of the fiscal year if you are filing uh, via paper or 110 days if you're filing uh, via electronic formatting. But do note that if you're doing electronic formatting, you still have to send the cover page and uh, the signed cover page and the census form by mail in order for your package to be considered complete. Um, for hospital districts, uh, there's not very many, but uh, they do have a different filing requirement. And for hospital districts, it's 120 days after the close of their fiscal year. Um, please do note that biannual and five-year reporting districts are required to file a compensation report um, and the completed financials on an annual basis. Uh, if you don't have any financial transactions during that year, you must still file the cover page at the general information section, and on the cover page, you would just know that there was no activity and send that in. Um, if you have no financial transactions, but you have outstanding debt, uh, taken out in the special district's name, then you must report the debt and any debt payments on the long-term debt and revenues, expenses, and changes in fund equity form. Now, you might ask if you're running a little behind and you don't think you're going to meet these requirements, well, the state controller's office do not grant any extensions. Um, so what you, what you would recommend to do is file uh, via their um, file their transfer protocol uh, because that way you have the 110 days rather than the 90 days. If you do not uh, file your report, you will get a letter from the state controllers um, saying that you're delinquent. Uh, once you have received your written notification, you have 20 days uh, to send in your report and if you do not, there is a fine that's associated with that and the fine depends on total revenue but the fine typically ranges from $1,000 to $5,000, and if you would like uh, the breakdown, you can reference code 53895. Uh, for the County Artillery Auditor Controller, which that would be us, um, we require you to send your audit report uh, the same 12 months after the year end of your exam of the reporting year and you can send it to us via mail, and I have provided the address there. Um, if you are sending it to us via mail, please um, address it to the Chief of Financial Reporting and Audits, so that way it gets to us because there are several different depart or divisions that deal with special districts. Uh, if something new uh, that we're personally implementing, um, we have created an email address uh, specifically for special districts, um, that email address is sdaudits at co.tillary.ca.us uh, and you can send your audit reports via email uh, just on a subject line. Do, uh, we, we would prefer if you do the district name and then uh, the year under examination. Uh, a lot of special districts also have their CPA firm submit their audit report to us and that's perfectly fine as well. Any questions on filing requirements? Um, I have a few examples, uh, just because not all of the special districts are uh, this will be on June 30th. The first one is the straightforward one, and it's the June 30th, uh, June 30th, 2014. Uh, so if your report is due 
for the period ending June 30th of 2014. It must be submitted by June 30th of 2015, and we will document it in the Special District Monitoring Report in 2015. Um, however, if your audit report is for the period ending December 31st of 2013, you have those 12 months to submit it, so it will be December 31st of 2014 when it's due, but it will not get documented until, uh, uh, until uh, the Special District Monitoring Report in uh, 2015. Example number three, there is a typo, it should be June instead of September. Um, and this one deals mainly with for biannual audits. So if your audit reports for the two years ending June 30th of 2014, it must be submitted by June 30th of 2015, and it will be documented in the Special District Monitoring Report uh, 2015. Note that in contrary to the state controllers, uh, we do not require you to send your audit report on an annual basis if you are a biannual um, or a five-year reporting district. You only have to send it in on your reporting year. Okay, so moving on to audit report format. Um, according to California Code of Regulations 1131.4, uh, you must have a title page, a table of contents, uh, an opinion, basic financial statements, supplementary information, and other schedules which would typically uh, include your statistical tables if you have any. It should also contain your management's discussion and analysis, an independent auditor's report, and it shall um, state whether the financial statements are presented in accordance with generally accepted uh, principles of accounting and the state controller's minimum audit requirements and reporting uh, guidelines. There are four different types of opinions. Uh, the best one would be an unqualified opinion, so that's the one that you want to go for. And then uh, the worst one would be a disclaimer of opinion, which is no opinion and was rendered. The audit report shall contain basic financial statements that present an overall view of the district, um, including notes that explain some of the information, some things that we review um, and go on our special district monitoring report is uh, whether there was a net loss or a decrease in net assets, also if there's a going concern statement. Um, and then lastly, we also review for um, excess cash investments outside of the county treasury and I have provided two tables. This first table lists the districts that are not required to uh, have their cash investments in the county treasury and then on my far right it's the government code section so if you um, just for reference and purposes. The second table um, is the special districts that are required to have their cash investments with the county treasury and as well I have stated the government code next to each district's name. Um, on this last uh, slide I have provided some resources for you. Um, the first one is the government code section so that lists all the government code sections and uh, if you go into their webpage the first page will say um, it has the breakdowns of all the different special districts, so it's kind of easy to navigate through it. Um, the second one is the State Controller's Office, as far as the templates go. Um, and then I've also provided the instructions, or the, the PDF to the instructions for the financial transaction report. And then lastly is the, um, the reporting forms. Towards the end of, at the end of the presentation, um, there is a list that uh, lists all the special districts and whether they're uh, required to file well, either annually, biannually, or every five years. So if you can please review that and make sure that your special district is under the correct category. Um, if there have been changes, um, you please email you can also email us at that uh, email address that I provided, which is the SD audits. Um, so that way we can update our files. Any questions? All 
right, so now um, Sue Copeland will be presenting allocations and direct charges. Thank you. let's say I need a million dollars you tell the auditor I need that million dollars and they would tax everybody to get that money that you needed after 1978 with the prop 13 that no longer works anymore so now this is the new way of how you are going to get the money from the property tax system so some of the things that it did was revise um, the way that the dollar tax rate is used and there's one dollar and everybody's going to get a piece of that. So we use some of the base tax revenue from 1978, 79. This is all set, uh, all done at the legislation at the state level. And um, so the auditor is just fulfilling the requirements from what the state had us do. Um, ties the allocation to your tax growth on the slightest basis. And it introduced the concept of a tax rate area. <coughs> and an annual tax increment. And the increment is the growth from, obviously, from year to year. So what is a tax rate? And you can see as this all fills in, we can have, your, your district can be in different tax rate areas. So it's not just your, little, your area is that triangle right there, but you are actually involved in four or five different tax rate areas. And all of that in combination comes up with your growth. So your far right corner might be growing, but your far left corner isn't growing. So it's just a total of everything that's in the district. So those are all our tax rate areas. So you can see that your district can be in a city, it can be in the county, it can be in one school district or it can be in another school district. And the same with the, the county can have um, all the different districts all over. We have kind of a little pyramid going here where we have the parcels on top, then comes the tax rate areas, and under all those areas are all the schools, the cities, the counties, the special districts that are all part of that tax rate area, and then we have our total tax levy, which of course is the total of everything, all the assessed value um, in our county. The top number, the number of parcels, actually expanded. It's 174,000 this year. This was actually from last year. And we have a lot of annexations going on. A lot of subdivisions are starting to come back in. So our one parent parcel is now becoming 200, that type of thing. So we actually did expand that quite a bit. The tax rate areas are very generally the same. We have two more. So 1,201 of them. And um, then the, all of the districts down there are 207. So that's all of our cities and county special districts schools. So now, how do we take all of that information? And how do you get your money? So I'm going to allocate the money taking last year's allocation. We're going to add to that any jurisdictional changes that you've had. So you've either annexed something in or you've detached it. And then we're going to add your share of the assessed value growth if you're not in an RDA area. And then if there's any state shifts, which of course will tell us about, the state will tell us what they want us to share, do the plus or minus, and that's going to be this year's allocation. Now, that's what we would call your gross levy. So if you're familiar with the Tulare County website, there's all kinds of reports out there that we try to put all this information out there. And under the gross levy, there are a couple of them. Um, that will tell your agency's increment, how much did your area grow, 
and there's also um, would tell you from each area. So you can actually when you look at your area, which area of yours actually did all the growth in for your um, agency. So now we have this year's allocation, and then of course next year. Um, oh, sorry. So we have the allocation. And then I have to add to that anything that um, the triple flip is the sales tax and VLF, and now we have ERAF, which is the schools, and so we're either going to add to you or subtract for you to get your actual revenue. And then this current year becomes next year's allocation. We start all over again every year. So some of the consequences of that is now you've owned your home for 30 years and you've lived in that same home, your increase of your assessed value, so your taxes, generally can only go up 2% or less. But your neighbor who just bought his house three years ago bought it at market value, his value is starting at that market value. So I just kind of looked at what now we're saying 10 to, 10 to 20 times, and that can be true. Right now, not so much in our area just because our growth is not as much. Our homes, the market value is not skyrocketing like it was before. But if you've been in your house 30 years and bought it at for $60,000 value, you're probably, your value is probably only $90,000. But your neighbor who just bought it a few years ago bought it at about $115,000. So right off the bat, they're starting already, they're going to pay more taxes than you've been paying all this time um, for the past 30 years. So that's just kind of something when somebody says, why are they paying more taxes? Well, that's because you've lived in your house longer and have a lower base. Um, so one other point was that when Prop 13 came in, um, more than 40% of that property tax relief, yes, it did help the homeowners, but a lot of it went to the corporations, businesses, and of course, landlords, anybody who owns more than one home. It's no longer the local, so our local people are not saying we need this amount of money. The state is actually saying this is how much you're going to get. And they can also take it away. Um, allocation formulas are large variations and they're somewhat outdated. It was all based on pre-1978 ratios. So. That's what started, so whatever you asked for in 1977, 78, pretty much that's what your ratio is set on. So if you happen to have asked for a lot of taxes in that particular year, then you got a higher ratio than another special district who really didn't, they had um, stuff on hand, they really didn't need anything, so they didn't ask for it. So their ratio is a whole lot smaller. And um, so the share of the base doesn't change, so. Here in 1978, we're setting these ratios. Those aren't going to change unless there's some type of um, annexation. So again, it's a zero-sum game. There's one dollar, and everybody's going to get a piece of that one dollar. And so if somebody gains something, somebody else is going to lose something. So it all is the same. OK, so the other factors, of course, would be annexations. So when cities annex the area or a special district annexes some other area or detaches, so you can, um, you would either gain, you could actually gain some, um, some increment from that, so you can get some new growth. Um, unless you're in a redevelopment area and they're still receiving all growth in that area. Um, pass-through agreements, so with the old, with the old RDAs, there's still pass-through agreements, those are still valid. And so the agencies can receive some of that money back. And the ERAF, which is the Educational Revenue Augmentation Fund, and that's where the state came in and basically shifted some money away from special districts. And most of our special districts really do get hit quite a bit, as well as the county and um, the cities. And this money just shifts away. You don't see it. Okay, so now we're going to develop the formula. So the revenue collected is tabulated by the district in each of our tax rate areas. And remember we got frozen factors from 1978. And again, that was based on that percent of revenue back in the day, back in 1978. And now the total of all the factors in the TRA is 100%. So every TRA has a factor of one or 100%, and then all of those add together 
come up to each of the agencies. So whatever tax rate area you are in, your agency is in, add all those together, and that's how we come up with the total of your revenue. And that happens for all 200 of the agencies. And so the assessed value is, um, by each charity, is distributed by the frozen factor of each charity. So here, if we look at this one here, um, you can see that in 1978, the revenue, and we're just going with basically the TRA total of 1,000, so the county passed the 200 or the 320, and the school district A is the 500, city 110, the memorial district is 10, the fire district is 40, and the cemetery is, district is, is 20, the cemetery district. So every year, whatever is collected in that, it's all going to go by that same frozen factor percent without our shifts. So that's the basic. It starts with that right there. So for every dollar that we collect, the county will get the 32 cents, the cemetery district gets two cents. And that's before we've shifted anything away that the state has said, and the graph is, is that biggest one. So then we would take all 2,000 of our TRAs and add up all those 32 cents for the county across the board, whatever their factor is, and it's amazing how different the frozen factors are in each of the tax rate areas. They're very similar, but they're not quite the same. And then this next one, actually at the very bottom, it just it's the very same tax rate area with the same percentages, but it just gives a little bit more of what I just what basically we just talked about is how do we get the annual tax increment from these frozen factors. So, and we call that 88, and that's because it came from the state as a single bill, number eight. So that's just a little bit more of a description done. What is it that you came about after the There are a lot. What? There are a lot. If the district is formed after I have my frozen factors here. Now there's, there is, if the cemetery district is taken over by another cemetery district, then that's okay. But if in my, if in our little scenario here, a water district wants to come in, they don't get a piece of that dollar. They're not there at the beginning. They don't get one right now. Question? So what is the effect of annexation on this percentage and the water plan to have? Okay, so that is about two slides from now. So yes, there is, there is definitely, um, there is, Something does happen. So that's the only thing that actually will affect these. So if you can hang in there for just about two more slides. Okay, so let's just really quickly, the types of property that we're talking about. So the, the secured is the land and improvements. The unitary is what the state is assessing. That's our, um, all of the utilities. So Southern Cal Edison, Southern Cal Gas, Verizon, that type of thing. And those are assessed at the state level and then our unsecured, which is not attached to the land. So businesses, equipment, and plants. So when we're talking assessed value, that's what we're talking about, is that right there. And the supplemental is the increase in your assessed value when you purchase your home. So that's also additional secured and unsecured. But the assessed value is where we're getting our, our ending dollar, how to distribute it. <coughs> okay, so jurisdictional changes and annexations. Um, the eight cities, they all have the same master agreement. And um, the basic revenue amount stays the same with the original agency. So the, um, the growth goes to the city based on like TRA and the county island. Um, there can be agreements with the city and the base can move to the city. So this has to be a special agreement. But right now, if a city annexes from the county, basically the original base amount so when we were talking about that first slide where I get your bottom number there, that will stay with the county and it's only going to be the new growth to go to the city. Um, special districts. So they are all covered under the board resolution. Uh, base revenue amount stays with the original agency and all growth will go to the new agency and the new, new district, no part of the dollar distribution. So if we have, again, we have a cemetery district that took over another cemetery district, the original cemetery district would keep the base, but the new cemetery district would get any new growth. So as there is building growth, um, sales that make the values go up, 
then the new district, the new cemetery district would receive those. What about the valuation from the annex district? Does that just go away back to the county or does it become part of the base for the new combined entity? Now it depends on what type of annexation are you talking about. So if it is a district taking over the exact um, district, what the district does at the same time. So if it's a cemetery district taking over the duties of the cemetery district, then the original cemetery district keeps the base and the new one will get only growth that goes along at the same percentage. Okay. My question was what happens to the allocation from the district that went away? Does it go away or does it become part of the new entity? Well, the, right, the original, the original, so are you saying that the original district is completely gone? It dissolved? It, it was taken over by the first one. And the first one takes over. Right. So then the first one gets the increment from that point forward, they would get everything. From both districts? From the original district, they would get the base, and then they would get the new, the new information, or the new amount from the, the growth. And that's only because they took it over. I mean, they completely, one dissolved completely and is taking and doing the same exact thing. Right. But if it was the original district is still there and there was just a, whatever reason, they wanted to de-annex it and the other one was going to come in, they don't get the base, they only get the base. So if you're going to take over an area, take it over completely and dissolve the other district. <coughs> the district is involved. Well, if I'm hearing you correctly, dissolving it, the asset that goes away, your allocation does, it combines them and it doesn't. Is that what you're That saying? is correct. So okay, if so they're... If you don't want to dissolve it, because if you dissolve it, the allocation goes away. Make sure it's in your agreement, right? right exactly. Right. So when you, yeah, so when you come to your agreement, make sure that you, the, you bring that all out in the agreement. Because we have had some of that, that's kind of happened, that the district is still there, but it does not still, there, there's no other, nobody else has come in and done the same um, duties that an ambulance district or a hospital district. So it's still there, it's still receiving that money. Even though it's not doing the duties, but nobody else has taken that over. So it will still receive it. So just depends on where, where it's at. And also, again, if it's a brand new district coming in, they're not going to get any part of the dollar. And make sure in your agreement that you talk about the increment and the base and say where each is to go. If you just talk about the taxes, it's just going to be the increment. So make sure you spell it out correctly in your agreement with both parts. Because that's been a, something that's happened through the years and some districts haven't necessarily done that. And they didn't realize they lost a minute because they didn't do it right in the agreement. They had to go back and redo it. But along the way, they lost some money. Last. So, new, new, new services, I guess, is where I was going with that. New services, you don't get a piece of that doll. But taking over the old services, and talking about it in your district or in your um, resolution when you're actually going to do it is the main thing because you want the base. You want that chunk that was there in the first place. You want that to come to you. So here's our jurisdictional change. So in the very first two columns is our before annexation and we have our base revenue and our frozen factor. And by the way, this is not the same TRA as that other one because now we have different, different numbers here. So in the, in the before, the city is not a piece of this. But now the city, after, so in the second set of column, after the annexation, the city is going to come in. But you see the base revenue didn't change. The base revenue is still staying with the county, even though their frozen factor has now <clears throat> changed, and the city is now going to get their 15%, but they're not going to get it from that original base. They're only going to get any new growth that happens. So that's where, that's when, in that particular case, what's covered in right now, our Board of Supervisors, when a city annexing, annex, annexes area, they do not get the base, they only get the growth. And so now if we go to the last set of columns, now we have our new annexation 
um, with the growth. And you see there's $100 worth of the growth. So now how are we going to spread that out? So you're taking the $100 by all those factors, and you'll see that the city is going to get the 15, but there's zero there, so their total is only 15. They're not getting anything else out of that original 420, um, and then the county is getting only 32 instead of the 42. And then the um, everybody, else, well, fire district completely doesn't get anything now. They only get the base. So that's where the city came from, is it came from part from the county and part from the fire district, because they're taking on the services now. So that's showing that the base is important, but that's the agreement that the county has right now with all the cities, and has had for years. So now here's our total revenue, now we have that $100 more, and it's to be distributed. Um, Again, that's all that the city's going to get is the $15, or 15 Okay, so then we still have redevelopment. The purpose originally was to clean up the blight, help, help, help economic development, um, the tax distribution of that. The taxing agencies are frozen now, so whatever the base share of the redevelopment coming in, the taxing agencies are not going to be receiving any more money. They're receiving what they received at the time that redevelopment came in. The gross pass-through agreements, um, they were negotiated pre-AB 1290, which was 1994, and then after that, it was mandated by the state, and there are certain tiers and certain amount of money that you're going to get back. Um, but the main thing is, is that the redevelopment is the growth. And then this will show that, that here was our city area, we have our before annexation, then we have our after annexation, where you can see that the, um, the new growth, the fire district will not be receiving any new growth, the city gets the 15, and the county gets the 32. But it's in the RDA. So now that $100 worth of growth completely goes to the RDA, which is at the bottom there. So the city ends up not getting anything at all because it all goes to the RDA. And just a quick note on the RDA, I'm not sure where I have that at, but they're still in existence. Even though they have been removed or dissolved by the governor, they're still in existence. Until, oh, next slide, sorry. So the dissolution, you all heard that, possibly heard that they're gone. Well, they were dissolved, but they are not gone until they are completely paid off. So all of their debt has to be paid off. And in the case of some of them, it's going to be another 30 years. So they will still be taking the increment from city, county, special districts until that's all completed. So that's just some of the, this, this is just some of the uh, time frame of when that all happened. But again, the main thing is, is that continues until they are completely paid off. Um, one of the things that you're probably noticing as a special district, if you are in a former redevelopment agency area, you are getting your pass-throughs consistently now because the auditor is paying that to you. And then you're also getting the residual amount. So as you're looking at your uh, financials, the revenue source 4060 is residual. And what that means is that all the money, all the increment, all the, ta um, the tax money that goes to the redevelopments, once they have paid all of the bills, that the state has said they are allowed to pay, so basically all of their bonds, any remaining money goes back to all of those agencies that are in that tax rate area. So the school districts, the county, the city, and the special districts will receive a portion of that, that money back. So you might be noticing more and more, especially if you're in, in the Exeter area, you're getting a lot of residual, because Exeter's RDA has zero um, do so they don't get anything. It's all coming back to the special districts and the cities and counties. So, but again, that's going to continue until it's completely dissolved. And there's some rules on how they need to do that, and the state will be catching up to them pretty quick. So, on the website, um, which is here, um, it's the CSAC website. It's an entire book on demystifying the California system. So if you ever want to have some interesting reading, um, it shows you how it came about, how it works. 
So from that, I'm going to get your factor, and now I'm going to allocate the money. So after the tax collector collects all those tax bills that are out there, then everybody has their piece of the dollar. So literally all 200 agencies are getting the factor that goes out to six digits, and then I allocate the money. And special districts should be looking for more money this Friday. So we did a, a second um, second apportionment from the 11th of December, collections from the 7th of December, 11th of December 31st. So any other questions on that really interesting? I mean, I know you'd rather just have money. But that's how it comes about. And it's, it, it's really different. And the state constantly is changing things and constantly coming up with new things and new ideas. And we just interpret what they do and try to get the money out to you. But if you haven't taken a look at the county's website, go in there and take a look at and, and the property tax accounting. It's going to be all under control and then property tax accounting. And we try to put as many reports out there as we can that give you values and taxes and uh, uh, revenue estimates and all of that. So, um, And then the second part of it that I was going to talk about is the direct charges. Now, what's in the packet is exactly what you get sent every year, and we're, we're pretty fine-tuned to that. We don't have too many questions from our special districts who are putting special assessments or direct charges on the um, tax roll. So since it's all in there, you can take a look at it. Is there anything that anybody who is putting a direct charge on the tax roll might have a question about? Um, and pretty much it's just a, it's a, on a parcel bars, basis. We turn that information in to the auditor in August. And I think the main thing that we have is I do have uh, Chris, would be the one that everybody would have talked to the last couple of years, and he tries to send out a reminder email to everybody. End of July, beginning of August, hey, if you haven't turned it in, get it turned in, that kind of thing. But these are the over and above the 1%, this is a special tax that can go, excuse me, the direct charge that can go on. Landscape and lighting, sewer charges, delinquent sewer charges, that type of thing. So again, it's all in there. The information that's in there is from this year. That's already passed. We don't have the um, paperwork for next year, which will be due August 2016, but it'll pretty much be the same thing. There's the you know, all the forms that we ask you to fill out, turning it in electronically, it's a lot cheaper. So if you haven't already done so, try to switch over to um, electronic filing and it's all, all the information on how to do that is in there. And you can always give the office a call because the person would be, he'd love to walk you through it. Fair Political Practices Commission contact information. Uh, they are the best resource. It's 
you know, and their website is a, is um, a good way to get your questions answered um, when it comes to the Forum 700. Uh, we included the mission of the Fair Political Practices Commission in the slideshow because uh, it kind of gives you an idea of what what the point of the forum is. Um, they are. They were created to promote the integrity of state and local government in California through fair and partial interpretation and enforcement of political campaign, lobbying, and conflict of interest laws. And they regulate campaign finance and spending, lobbyist registration and reporting, post-governmental employment, uh, mass mailings, financial conflict of interest, gifts, to public officials, etc. Uh, so the three main questions that I'm going to attempt to answer are why do public officials have to fill it out, who has to fill it out, and how much of it do you have to fill out? Because really there is quite a bit that, uh, quite a bit to the form, um, sort of like separate parts of the form, many of which you may not even have to fill out, and then others which you may need to fill out but which won't actually apply to you. And it can be a little bit overwhelming. So first, uh, why do you have to fill it out if you do? Um, because the Political Reform Act, uh, which the goal is to promote fairness, integrity, and impartiality. Uh, and so, as I put here, it's all about conflicts of interest and making sure that um, that that not only sometimes either that either people that have conflicts or um, perceived conflicts, financial conflicts, etc., are either uh, disclosing that they have those conflicts, and then at a certain threshold, they are actually um, forced to recuse themselves from actually participating in certain decisions. Um, so, as I said, there are two main components: disclosure and disqualification. Um, the disclosure, the form is obviously disclosure, um, and we will be disclosing, including um, the thresholds that will mean disqualification. Who has to complete it? I put a big long list in here. Um, it's in here. I can read it, uh, but I'm just going to kind of try to go through it. Uh, there are some people that have to uh, file by statute, and then there are some that have to file due to the conflict of interest code. We call them code filers. And um, candidates running for office, members of newly created boards and commissions that don't actually already have a conflict of interest code, and employees in newly created positions. Uh, so, no public official at any level of state or local government shall make, participate in making, or in any way attempt to use his official position to influence a governmental decision in which he knows or has reason to know he has a financial interest. And then apparently I made myself a note to add references, which I did not do. So I apologize for that. The definition of a public official um, is basically every member of a local government agency. It's very helpful. Um, and so I'm going to go back to statutory filers first. Um, there's a long list of offices. It's found in the government code. Uh, it includes certain elected officials and candidates, other public officials who manage public investments, um, really, the best thing is to, is to see the list in the government code. Um, a lot of us are code filers, um, which means that every agency has to come up with a conflict of interest code. And that conflict of interest code basically designates um, which positions have to disclose and what those positions have to disclose. And an agency is any state or local government agency. So you should have already a conflict of interest code. And as I said, um, they, you, the conflict of interest code will list the particular titles um, that are required to disclose on Form 700. 
And then there's a separate portion of that, which is for each particular position that's listed, then what are their disclosure requirements? So statutory filers, and that's the one that I said you need to look at the government code for the complete list. Those require complete disclosures. The code filers are the ones that actually just require, are just required to um, disclose what their conflict of interest code says that their position has to disclose. Statutory filers are going to be uh, disclosing investments, interest in real property, income, business positions. There are a lot of detailed rules about what has to be disclosed. And that's why, again, I initially pointed you directly to the um, FPPC website because the Form 700 has instructions and then there's actually another little booklet that it points you to to help answer the questions about whether you actually have to disclose something. Once you even know that you have to disclose, for example, in the, you have to disclose your investments. Well, then you want to understand what what constitute the kind of investment that you have to disclose. And there's distinctions about whether you actually control the, um, the buying and selling of stocks or if it's in some kind of a mutual fund where you don't, then you may not have to. And I myself, when I fill it out every time, I get very confused and I look at the instructions um, ad nauseum. So, I'm trying to be helpful here, but it's pretty complicated. It's hard to give a presentation and that will really address all of the concerns. Um, so, as I said, the code filers, uh, the conflict of interest code will have two parts to it. The list of jobs that have to file and what each job uh, title, the person in that job has to disclose. Each agency defines its own disclosure categories for each position based on the type and scope of work performed. So if somebody um, doesn't have, um, the, the example that um, one woman in our office often gives is that um, a librarian who's in charge of selecting what books are purchased for the children's section of the library would not necessarily need to disclose that um, she has an interest in um, a certain um, property uh, management or, or real estate uh, consulting company that the county is going to use or may use to buy a land for the library because nothing to do with her job actually has anything to do with what decision is made as to what land to purchase, etc. So that's why your job description then will determine what areas of your life you have to talk about in Form 700, basically. Is this making sense? Kind of, a little bit? Yeah. I have a question about the buying a real property. Mm -hmm. Um, it depends on what your whether you're a statutory filer or a code filer, and it can depend on um, usually just owning real property outside of the district won't have any effect. Um, but if you were to have an investment in a company that does business in your district, then that would be something more likely to be disclosed. Um, but again, it depends on whether you're a statutory filer or if you're a code filer and what your conflict of interest code uh, um, covers. I don't know when owning property outside the district is something that's necessarily disclosed. Um, but it, it would depend. I don't know if, there, if there's any situation which you'd need to. But. Um, so again, there can be things that you have to disclose, but only if they're relevant and your code will det determine if you need to or not. Um, there are rules for gifts and um, for statutory filers, the gifts have to be reported even if they're irrelevant um, or, um, or seemingly irrelevant. 
There are now special regulations for how to report gifts from multiple donors. So now you must only disclose the group gift only if the individual, if an individual donor con contributed fifty dollars or more per gift uh, to the gift. So um, now, if the group gift is over fifty dollars, that doesn't necessarily need to be reported as a gift unless the individual individual gave more than fifty dollars. But you have to keep track of the individual donors because if they participate in several group gifts to you and they um, contribute forty nine dollars each time, then really aggregately they give me more than fifty dollars and that's a problem. Um, so threshold for disclosure of gifts on Form 700 is $50 or more from a single source in a calendar year. Um, and then there are other thresholds that will um, not only be disclosed, but then they will trigger actually disqualification. So um, now these are old numbers, and I apologize. I had a note to myself to check them, and I didn't see it when I was doing my final draft. So. I'm not sure of the current numbers, but um, you can see that then there's more than two, something like more than $250 plus inflation from a single source in a rolling 12-month period. Um, that could be, that can disqualify you from a governmental decision involving that single source. Um, there can be, there is a limit that, again, I'm not sure about where the number is now because sometimes they adjust these numbers. Um, where you can't even accept that gift. I have a question. Yeah. Is there a website to place a person to go look and find out what the current value is? Yeah, I, that's a, if you go to the FBPC website, and you should be able to find out all that information. Um, and if not, again, I have my cards here, so any follow-ups that you can't, if you still have a burning question, um, you can let me know if you weren't able to find the information and I will find it because I feel valued and I didn't have a free the net. Um, campaign contributions are not gifts, but they still must be disclosed on the forms. They don't affect the ability to participate in an elected capacity, but they may affect your ability to vote as a member of the board if um, you're considering a matter involving somebody that gave you um, a large contribution. Um, again, these are numbers that, that may be sort of old, um, that have to do with the amounts and then um, being disqualified from the decision. Uh, as I, I had in a previous slide, I don't know if I said it or not, but the um, conflict of interest codes have to cover consultants, and the rules with regard to consultants are kind of complicated, um, and the disclosures, the disclosures can be more limited than for the regular staff positions, but they do have to be included. Um, so the recommended actions are to uh, direct the chair of the board to work with staff to determine which independent contractor should be treated as consultants and what the responsible individuals need to disclose. Um, and this goes back to determining who needs, who's in charge of what and so why, what is it important that we know that they have an interest in before they're allowed to make decisions. So the obligations um, regarding Form 700 are personal. Um, it's not up to your board to make sure that you fill out the Form 700 correctly. It's you that has to fill out the Form 700 correctly. Uh, good faith reliance on legal advice does not bar the Fair Political Practices Commission from pursuing action against you. Um, the written advice from the FPPC about a question that you have is the only real safe approach. But saying all this, the form is difficult, but it's not that hard, you know what I mean? So it, you, unless you're really concerned about um, some distinctions or you really for some reason don't want to disclose something that you think you might have to disclose but you're not sure, then you should be talking to the FPPC. 
Um, but I don't want to make it sound so overwhelming. You probably, I'm assuming, have already filled out this form. Um, so this should just be a review. I don't want it to seem like um, super duper scary. Um, so now these are public documents. Just remember that. Um, and the filing officer must permit any member of the public to inspect any uh, statement. So that is a reminder to you as um, the person filling out the form and uh, to any custod custodian of the forms themselves. Um, and again, no information or anything may be required from the person seeking access. Reproduction fees of no more than 10 cents per page may be charged. Uh, the department can take longer to provide Form 700s if they are old enough to have been sent to storage. That's all about public um, public access to it. Any questions? All right. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for coming. Um, again, I have my my cards up here. I would also be interested to know if there are some. Uh, topics that you would like to see covered in this kind of training um, as opposed to something that we did cover or something we've covered in the past you'd like a refresher on, what you thought about what was covered, that would be very helpful to us. So, thank you.